Thank you very much and, and uh, good evening everybody. It's a real honor and pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to speak with you about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. And I know the subject is safety and security, so I'm going to try and, fair, uh, and make the link uh, from safety to security uh, as we go through this. But what I want to do in the roughly hour that I have is talk to you a little bit about how accident investigation has evolved over the years and why. What is the, what is the research that has led to changes um, in the way we investigate accidents? Because that's also informing the way we manage safety. And so what I'm going to do is talk about the evolution of accident investigation, talk about uh, some accidents that the TSB investigated. I'm going to cover three. Um, and then show you how that's led us to support the notion of safety management systems. And I think there is a parallel to some extent with security management systems um, as a way for organizations that are involved in, in safety critical activities to manage the safety risk. So let's, before I start though, let me tell you just a little bit about the Transportation Safety Board of Canada. So we are an independent federal agency whose only mandate is to advance transportation safety by conducting independent investigations in the air, rail, marine, and pipeline modes of uh, federally regulated transportation in Canada. So we conduct independent investigations. What we're looking for is to find out what happened, but more importantly, why it happened. So we want to find the causal and contributory factors, want to identify safety deficiencies, make recommendations where appropriate, and then report publicly. When I say independent, I mean that we report directly to the Canadian Parliament through the President of the Queen's Privy Council. A lot of people think we're part of Transport Canada. We are not. We're independent of transport so that we can comment on their activities as well and we're free from any uh, potential restraints on, on that note. It's very important to note that uh, it's not our function to assign blame uh, or to determine civil or criminal responsibility. There are judicial processes and other processes for that. We're not a regulator. So as I go through the various um, uh, examples uh, and case studies that I'm going to talk about tonight, I try and use language that is in the report, only what's in the report, um, and also a language that is non-judgmental. Because at the end of the day, what we want to find out is what needs to be done to, uh, to avoid such accidents uh, or occurrences in the future. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of accident investigation. And I show this as a bit of a ladder. Now this is really applicable to aviation and I'm going to focus most of my talk on aviation tonight with one exception. But if you think back to the early days of aviation, and I mean the really early days of aviation, particularly when it became commercial and there were accidents, what did people look at? Well typically they wanted to find out what broke. It was a mechanical, what was a, what, you know, mechanically failed or broke that contributed to the accident? Or was it weather? Um, especially back in the old days when we didn't have the kind of sophisticated navigation and radio communications that we have today. But then as, as time moved on, um, investigators started looking at the ergonomic issues. So how are, how are instruments displayed to the pilots, to the crew? How are levers positioned? Where are they? What are their shapes? Something as simple as the shape of a, of a handle that raises or lowers the landing gear being different from the one that l raises or lowers the flaps. And then it moved on, uh, probably around the 60s or so, to look at physiological factors. So things like fatigue, uh, spatial disorientation, uh, illusions that are created uh, by our you know, vestibular canals and, and uh, those kind of uh, things and how they can affect um, a crew. Then it went on to look at cognitive and psychological factors. So the things that affect how we make decisions and particularly how we manage risk. So thing you, you, you may be familiar, if any of you have studied psychology, about you know, cognitive biases like expectation bias or plan continuation bias. That when we look at an accident in hindsight, we can see that even though there was information that was presenting itself to the crew that suggested a different course of action, they continued down a path. And that's a function of how the mind works and the biases that we're all subject to. And then, uh, as we move forward now into the 80s, we started looking much more at the systemic factors. Uh, that, so the organizational and management factors that can contribute to accidents. And so when we conduct an investigation today, we look at all of that. We really do examine, like everything is on the table in terms of mechanical issues, human performance, physiological fatigue, 
cognitive decision making and, and these systemic and organizational factors. So this is the famous Swiss cheese model. Have you heard of the Swiss cheese model, some of you? They will, but yeah, this close. Okay, <laughs> so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. But essentially, um, what this does is it suggests that accidents and incidents are a combination of um, active failures, I'll use that word, failures, Okay, so in other words, human mistakes, pilot error, um, s some people call it, but that means people not following a procedure or omitting to do something they should have done or, uh, you know, but it's, it's basically an active uh, mistake. It's a lapse, it's a slip, it's people not doing what they should or doing something different. How that can combine with latent conditions in the system to prevent the window of opportunity for an accident to occur. Now, are you going to go into this in greater detail at some point? So I won't, I won't dwell on it here. But this is James Reason's model. And uh, although it's more than 30 years old, it still uh, is useful in terms of explaining to people how uh, it's not just the people at the front end, at the sharp end, the people who are doing the work, the pilots, the maintainers, the, the ground crew, et cetera. Uh, making mistakes that contribute to uh, to accidents and incidents, you have to look pa you have to look back and look at how the system led them uh, to be in that situation in the first place, and how the system and the defenses in the system may have prevented an accident from occurring. The one limitation I find with that is it's very linear. It has a it's like one thing happens after the other. Life isn't like that. Life is chaotic. It's random and it's messy. So another, uh, another model that we, we use is called uh, Rasmussen's uh, model of safe operating envelope. And, and I'll talk a little bit about this before uh, moving into my first example. So we know, how many of you have heard a, a company say, safety is our top priority? Yeah, they all say that. But the reality is that all companies, if they intend to stay in business, have to manage competing priorities. They have to manage the priority of being financially viable. I mean, most companies are in the business to make money, so they have to, they have to be economically viable. Uh, they also have to be able to deliver the service or the product that they're in business to do, which means that they've got to be productive, they've got to be efficient, they have to have enough resources. If there's too much demand, then they can't uh, provide the service. Uh, if the service is too costly, then it becomes economically unviable, they can, it can lead them to bankruptcy. But when you're talking about a safety critical industry like transportation, it also has to be safe. And so again, without getting into a lot of academic detail at this point, this blue dot really represents the status of a company at any point in time that is constantly navigating within those boundaries of productivity, financial viability, and safety. And there's constantly pressures that they have to contend with. And what happens is sometimes if some of these economic or workload pressures start to squeeze, it can start to push the safety, uh, the risk of the company from a safety perspective to the outer edges of the safety boundary. Now hopefully we have, and I, I'll send you an updated one that has marginal and boundary in there, but essentially this, this space here represents the margin of safety. Nobody wants to be operating right at the edge. If you're operating right at the edge, then the first thing that happens is pushes you over and you have an accident or a serious incident. So this can be defined by a number of things, including whatever defenses the company or the organization may have. And it's that margin. It could be defined by procedures, uh, by supervision, by training, uh, by all sorts of things that are trying to keep the organization from exceeding the absolute boundary that leads to an accident or incident. So these are some of the theories uh, that are at play and of course uh, we're now talking about resilience in organizations in terms of their ability to respond to adverse events, uh, prevent them or, or recover from them. So these are all some of the academic, um, I guess, underpinnings of the way that we uh, look at accidents and the way that we look at uh, how you manage safety. All right, so I want to start um, with my uh, first um, case study. And this is actually uh, a crash. I'm going to show you a video. It's actually a crash between a bus and a train. Now you'd say, this is an aviation course. Why am I showing you a crash of a bus and a train? It's because it's a very simple example, a simple accident to explain. And it shows um, very clearly uh, the systems approach uh, 
to, um, to managing safety and to investigating accidents. So I'm really hoping this is going to work. Um, but let's see. Is the audio on? On the morning of September 18th, 2013, OC Transpo Double Decker Bus Number 8017, operating as Express Route 76, arrived at the Fallowfield Bus Station in South Ottawa. The bus was en route towards downtown Ottawa along the transitway, a private two-lane roadway dedicated to commuter bus traffic. From the bus station, the transitway extends east to a left-hand curve which turns sharply north and runs parallel to Woodruff Avenue. The bus was in good mechanical condition. The driver was fit for duty and familiar with the route. Inside the bus, the driver's workstation included standard controls and several in-vehicle displays, one of which was a video monitor mounted above and to the left of the driver's seat. The video monitor's screen measured about six inches by four inches and was further divided into four smaller quadrants, each displaying a view from one of four onboard video cameras. The bottom right quadrant displayed the upper deck. OC Transpo required drivers to monitor this screen at station stops and while in service, and announced that no standing was permitted on the upper deck if passengers were seen standing, although there was no sign prohibiting this. At Fallowfield Station, passengers entered and exited the bus. The driver looked at the video screen and announced that there were empty seats on the upper deck. A passenger on the upper deck did not see any available seats and remained standing near the top of the stairs, visible on the driver's video screen. Just prior to departing Fallowfield Station, the driver was engaged in conversation with at least one passenger regarding seating availability on the upper deck. The bus departed about four minutes behind the scheduled departure time, with about 95 passengers on board. At this time, the flashing light and gate at the railway crossing were already activated. However, the driver's view was obstructed by trees, shrubs, and foliage. As the bus proceeded along the transitway, the driver would have overheard nearby passengers involved in conversations regarding the availability of seating on the upper deck. While negotiating the left-hand curve, a task that requires more attention than driving on a straight road, the driver was also likely distracted by the nearby conversations and by the perceived need to make an announcement that no standing was permitted on the upper deck. During this time, the driver looked up toward the video screen. With the bus accelerating towards the crossing, passengers began to shout, and the driver refocused attention on the road ahead and applied the brakes. As a result of the collision, Via Train 51 derailed. The bus was extensively damaged. The driver and five bus passengers sustained fatal injuries. Nine were seriously injured, and about 25 incurred minor injuries. So this happened in Ottawa, if, if you didn't figure that out already, I should have said that beforehand, um, in 2013. What do you think, I'll just switch back to, um, what do you think the first thing was that the, uh, I'll just go back to this so that, what do you think the first thing was the public said following this accident? Yeah. First thing was, it's the driver's fault. Unlike this accident happened pretty early in the morning. It would be a rare exception that, uh, that the driver could be drunk. But that's, that's a possibility. But um, no, the, the first thing that people said is, it's the driver's fault. But the driver was dead, and the driver couldn't explain why he reacted. In, in fact, why he did not stop, even though the gate was down, the lights were flashing, and the bell was ringing. How many of you saw the train coming before they actually show the intersect? Like, if you, yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty hard to see. The first time I saw this animation, and I knew what the out outcome was, I didn't see the train. So, all right. So I want to show you, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm just trying to show you the, uh, the principles here. But uh, essentially, uh, and this is probably too hard to read, and don't worry, about the, don't worry about the words, just look at the colors, okay, for now. You'll have access to this later. So what we looked at is, okay, the first thing is, what happened? The bus hit the train. The bus hit the train because it didn't stop. It didn't stop, in fact, although 
um, the lights, uh, the, the uh, active warning system for the train was, was, was activated. So the bus didn't stop, the locomotive derailed, and uh, we had a collision and derailment. So then we looked at, well, how was the bus performing? Well, at the time, the bus was actually, the, the speed limit on the, uh, on the transit way was 60 kilometers an hour, and the uh, bus was traveling at 67 kilometers an hour. So people said, well, the bus was speeding. But one of the reasons we found out is that just past the tracks, the, the uh, speed limit increases to 90. What do most people do when they see a speed limit increasing 100, 200 meters away. They don't wait till they pass it, they, they start going. The other thing was the bus had left the terminal late, four minutes late, so it had to catch up time. Um, and then we also looked at uh, the braking. The, the braking was, bus drivers are trained to brake progressively, because you can imagine if they slam on the brakes that uh, people that are standing uh, are gonna be thrown around. Uh, it's, it could be dangerous and it's certainly discomforting at the, le at the, at the least. So uh, we looked at the braking and, and how much, um, in fact, the, the, when the bus hit the train, the bus was going at about five miles an hour. So it had almost come to a complete stop. Um, so then we looked at the company practices and we looked at the training the drivers received with respect to braking, for example. Uh, we also looked at the fact that it was regular for buses to speed on that section of the transit way because it was a private transit way. It was only open to the transpo buses as well as the maintenance vehicles. So there was limited, if any, enforcement. And you also notice that video monitor, that was a procedure implemented by the company requiring the driver to look up and look at the video monitor to see if anybody was standing and then tell them they couldn't stand up there. But there were no signs up there saying you couldn't stand. So we looked at the company practices we looked at driving distractions. So what were some of the distractions? Well, first of all, the video monitor was definitely a distraction. The driver had to look up and away from the field of, of driving in order to, um, um, to see if anybody was standing. There were passenger discussions going on around them as about with regard to uh, availability of seating uh, uh, on the upper deck. And uh, the other thing was that um, there was a curve. You saw that it's a very accentuated curve. And when you're driving and you're turning on a curve, it requires more cognitive processing. And you tend to look to the inside of the curve, which in this case was away from where the train was coming rather than the outside. And then we also looked at uh, the crossing configuration. So that you notice was an at grade crossing. The road intersected the railway at grade. That was an area that the city of Ottawa had considered for an, a, a, either an overpass or an underpass. Citizens didn't want the overpass, they thought it was ugly, and they couldn't do an underpass because of soil considerations and the cost. So they stuck with an at-grade crossing, even though the frequency of buses and trains uh, intersecting was, was growing because of de uh, rapid development in that part of, of Ottawa. The, um, so that was one thing. And then the other thing was the, the line of sight towards the railway tracks was blocked by trees and shrubbery that hadn't been cut back. And then finally, uh, we also looked, I mean, you saw the pictures of the bus, we also looked at uh, the bus crashworthiness. Um, and what we discovered is that passenger buses don't, are not required to meet any kind of uh, reinforcement uh, standards in Canada because they're the biggest things on the road next to tank, uh, you know, uh, trailer um, trucks. Uh, and so it's believed that anything they're gonna hit uh, is gonna suffer as opposed to the bus. But in this case, it showed that the upper deck of the bus was not reinforced and, and tragically we had a, uh, another accident in Ottawa a couple of months ago uh, also involving a double-decker bus, also involving fatalities when the, uh, the bus, the double-decker bus hit a, a, a solid obstacle. So uh, what I'm showing you here is just to show how we went from it was the driver's fault. When we released this to the public, we said this could have happened to just about any driver. Now, if we hadn't, if we had just focused on, on these issues, we would have missed all of these other opportunities to improve safety. Okay, so that's the principle here, is you can't just look at any mistakes the individual may have made. It's not that, it's not about blaming an individual, it's about looking why what happened happened to them because if it happened to them, it can happen to others. And if we don't take steps to mitigate that from a systemic perspective, then we're not gonna improve transportation safety.
So before I go on to the next one, because now I want to use an aviation example and build on that, do you have any questions about this one or about the systemic notion of... So how long did this investigation take? Place? About two years. We, it happened in September 2013, and we released the report in the fall of 2015. We made five recommendations as a result of this report. Uh, one recommendation was to Transport Canada to work with provincial authorities to implement uh, standards for the uh, use, the installation and use of in-vehicle video monitors. Uh, another um, uh, recommendation, well, we made uh, two relating to grade crossing, one to Transport Canada to provide better guidance to uh, road authorities as to when to uh, consider grade separation. We made a specific one to the City of Ottawa to implement grade separation at this and two other crossings. And then we made um, another recommendation relating to um, uh, crashworthiness standards for buses, which has not been implemented and would take a long time if, even if it was. And also to have locomotive event, uh, sorry, um, event recorders, in other words, uh, data recorders on buses, the same way that we have on airplanes and trains. Okay, so we made five recommendations. They're all still uh, active. So the next uh, uh, accident that I want to discuss is uh, an aviation accident that uh, involved an aeromedical helicopter operated by Orange Helicopters uh, in uh, Ontario. It's the Ontario Provincial uh, Air Ambulance Service um, that operates helicopters. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit from my notes because, as I said, I always focus on the wording of the report. But shortly before uh, 7 p.m. on the evening of May 30th, 2013, Orange Rotor Wing uh, received a request for an emergency medevac flight for a patient in Attawapiskat. However, poor weather delayed the flight. Uh, they were leaving from Moosonee, Ontario, to go to Attawapiskat. And, uh, but uh, the weather improved such that shortly after midnight, the helicopter was uh, able to depart. So at 11 minutes after midnight, the helicopter departed from runway 6 at Moosonee with two pilots and two paramedics on board. They were going to Attawapiskat to pick up a patient to transfer the patient uh, to another facility. And the flight was going to be conducted under night, so it was at night, dark, visual flight rules, meaning the pilots operate with visual reference to the surface of the earth. They're not flying on instruments. As the helicopter climbed through 300 feet above ground into darkness, the first officer, who was the pilot flying, this, is, this was operated by a, a co-pilot and, and a captain, first officer who was the pilot flying, commenced a left turn, which you can see there, uh, and the crew began carrying out the post-takeoff checks. During the turn, the aircraft's angle of bank increase, so it started to incline further, and an inadvertent descent developed. Uh, as the captain completed the post takeoff check, he identified the excessive angle of bank, notified the first officer, the first officer said correcting. However, this occurred, um, uh, anyway, the, the captain went back to his checks, and the, then the aircraft started to descend, called for the first officer to initiate a climb. However, it occurred too late, and at an altitude from which it was impossible uh, to recover before hitting the ground. And so 23 seconds from the time the first officer initiated the turn um, at 300 feet above ground until they crashed, killing all on board. So what do you think the public said after this accident? Pilot, yeah. The first thing people want to know is, was it pilot error? This was a very experienced, the captain of this flight actually worked for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, very, very experienced captain, but this was, he had just started um, a second job, and it was a second job, it wasn't, his primary role was chief pilot for Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources with Orange Air Medical Services. So he didn't have a lot of experience flying, operating, he had a lot of experience on the helicopters, but not flying in those kind of operational conditions. The uh, first officer had considerably less experience uh, than the, the captain, but he had more experience at Orange, and so the captain decided on that night to, to let him fly. So let me, uh, again, I want to read to you a little bit from what, we, uh, what the report said. And I'll just uh, switch to, oops, 
And again, think of this is similar to the other diagram. Start at the bit here and then, and then move out. So the causes of this accident went well beyond the actions of this flight crew. As the crew turned toward Attawapiskat, and if you recall that left turn, they were turning into an area of total darkness. No moon, no stars, no ambient light on the ground. That would have required them to transition to flying on instruments, even though they were technically supposed to be visual, uh, with visual reference to the ground. And although both pilots were qualified to fly on instruments, neither one of them had recent proficiency in flying uh, at night on instruments in these kind of, of circumstances. So we identified issues with respect to, to training uh, and, and proficiency uh, of, of the crew. It was the role of the operator, Orange, rotary wing, to ensure that the crew was operationally ready for the flight. However, the pilots hadn't received sufficient and adequate training to prepare them for the challenges they faced that night, nor did the company's standard operating procedures address hazards specific to night operations. So most companies have standard operating procedures, but in this case, they didn't have SOPs specific to night visual operations. Uh, compounding this was the issue, so that's where we get into, so we've got, talked about training, we talked about procedures. Compounding the issue was that they had, uh, they had a chief pilot and a director of flight ops, two people doing the work of seven because they'd had a lot of turnover, uh, they weren't able to fill positions, and so uh, compounding uh, this whole issue was the issue of insufficient resources, inexperienced personnel in key positions, which led to some company policies being bypassed and ultimately a suboptimal crew pairing that night. Then, so that's, um, that's sort of here, the organizational factors. Then we also looked at the regulations. The regulations permitted this kind of flight. The weather was, at that point in time, suitable for night visual flight. But the area was so dark that it actually required them to fly on instruments. So we looked at night visual flight rules. We looked at these two, uh, they were qualified to fly on instruments, but they were only required to demonstrate that proficiency once a year, and they hadn't done regular instrument flying, because this was typically a visual operation. So they lacked instrument proficiency. Um, the proficiency checks that were administered by Transport Canada, so pilots have to undergo regular proficiency checks to make sure they're still, you know, qualified and proficient and so on, didn't distinguish between the role of a captain and the role of a first officer. And in fact, this captain, although he passed the, the flight uh, test given by uh, Transport Canada um, designated uh, pilot evaluator, the pilot evaluator had said, and the captain had agreed, that given his lack of experience in this type of operational environment, he probably should have been flying as a first officer and not as a captain. But because of the shortage of captains, they put him as captain, pilot in command, and, and, uh, and they paired him with a, a less experienced uh, uh, first officer. And then there was also stuff relating to the equipment on board the airplane, this, this, uh, uh, on board the helicopter. This helicopter didn't have any kind of terrain awareness warning system, so when it was descending, it had no warning, other than the pilot seeing the al altimeter unwinding and going down, it had no warning about terrain. And uh, the emergency locator transmitter, which goes off in the event of a crash to warn search and rescue, didn't work either. But then we went farther than this. When we looked at Transport Canada, who's the regulator, who's responsible to oversee these companies, and we discovered that they were well aware of the shortcomings that this company was facing and the fact that they were struggling, and uh, in fact had given them a lot of latitude to bring themselves into compliance with the regulations, to the point that um, really one of the things the report looked at is that maybe this co it would have been better to, to have this company shut down and not operate until it was able to demonstrate to transport that it could be compliant with the regulations and safely manage its, uh, its operations. So again, you know, if you just look at this, you'd say, okay, well, the, the, the pilots, um, it was pilot error, that's what caused the crash. They're dead. That, that problem, if it's them, that, you know, that problem is resolved but the safety issues are still there. And so that's why we needed to look at their training, company procedures, supervision, staffing, the regulatory environment in which this was, situation was allowed to happen, and then finally the, the oversight.
questions on this one before I go on to the next? I'll just show you. We made 14 recommendations in this case. Again, I'm not going to go into all of them, but it just shows you that um, we made a lot of recommendations with respect to emergency tra locator transmitter crashworthiness. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have made a difference in this case in the <coughs> sense that they died on impact. But in some cases, uh, if people survive and the search and rescue can't find them because the locator beacon doesn't uh, advise search and rescue, it could be a problem. And then we also made recommendations about flying visually at night, about instrument flying proficiency, uh, terrain awareness warning systems for helicopters, uh, pilot proficiency checks. And we made three recommendations to Transport Canada about how it conducts oversight of these category of, uh, of operators. And specifically, we want to see all small operators have safety management systems. We want to make sure that they can demonstrate that they're effective, and we want to make sure that Transport Canada takes action if they aren't effective, um, so that it, you know, in time, so it doesn't take, because they did take action after, but it was too late. Yes? Thanks, uh, Kathy. It sounds like the commander was aware, though, of what was happening. Mm -hmm. He prompted the mm -hmm. info a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So um, um, it sounds like you know, millimeters the other way, it could have been okay. Well, one of the things, for example, now, uh, and again, this is from the report, this particular first officer had flown with a different captain a few months previous, and the same thing had happened on takeoff, where he started a turn and then started to overbank and descend. That captain intervened more quickly and, and sort of saved the situation. But that was never reported to the company at the time. So that deprived everybody of an opportunity to learn from that and maybe take steps to make sure that the, that FO was, was qualified. In this case, one of the issues was that they turned out at 300 feet above ground, which is okay in day visual flight. But a lot of the more experienced pilots had adopted a practice, informal, not documented, not written down, of climbing at 500 feet. If they, uh, sorry, of turning at 500 feet. If they turned at 500 feet, chances are the captain could have recovered in time. So what we've seen from these two uh, examples really is that in order to manage safety effectively, you have to do it from a systems perspective. And safety management systems have been implemented in Canada in the air, rail, and some aspects of the marine industry um, as a more formal, documented way of managing the safety of an operation. So for example, in the air aviation, uh, CARS, that's the Canadian Aviation Regulations 107.3, defines all of the elements of a safety management system. Now, I'm not going to go through it uh, here in detail because that could be a lecture on its own, but when you boil it down to its basic elements, what are we talking about safety management system? Is that, yes, you have regulations that are intended to ensure safety, but regulations can't cover every possible eventuality. And so you need something beyond that. Yes, you have to be compliant with the regulations, but there needs to be something else. The companies need to be able to assess hazards in their operation and manage their associated risks. So safety management systems is a formal, documented way of doing that. It consists of a whole bunch of, of elements. And, but there are three pillars. One is identifying hazards, and then assessing the risk of that hazard, and then uh, mitigating it by procedures, equipment, training, uh, something to, to mitigate the, the, the risk of that hazard creating an accident. That's number one. But that depends on having good data. So data is what informs companies, safety professionals, about what the, risk, what the hazards are in the system that need to be mitigated. So there has to be, uh, within the organization, a formal way of, of uh, identifying safety concerns and getting people to report uh, and, and feel confident when they report that there'll be no reprimands and that they will, uh, that action will be taken, okay? But, so you can implement processes for that, but you also need a strong safety culture. So what's culture? I mean, that's another lecture in and of itself, but uh, essentially it's the norms, uh, the attitudes, the values um, that, that people bring to bear in an organization that defines how, how work gets done. So it's very all fine and well to have a procedure on the books, but if people say, well, we don't really do that, because if we do that, we can't get the job done, well, then you've eliminated one of the safety defenses in the system. So safety management systems are really about documented procedures, formal processes, 
but it's also about having the right mindset, which is commitment, cognizance, competence within the company um, to, uh, to manage safety uh, proactively and reactively. Again, I don't know if you're going to cover that later in detail, so I'll just skim over it now. So let me talk now about a company that had a safety management system. And it was our, and this is an airline that operating in Canada. And in light of what's happened in the last few days, uh, and I chose this example before, um, so I didn't have that in mind. But I'm going to talk about this investigation that we did back in 2011. This is a Boeing 737-600 series. It's not the uh, series that has been discussed in the last two days. And that's Sunwing. So let me talk about this one. Um, on March 13, 2011, a Boeing 737 was departing Toronto's Lester B. Pearson International Airport. And uh, they had 189 people on board and a crew of seven. And during the early morning departure, they departed just before 7 a.m., so it wasn't quite fully light yet, but it was dawn. Uh, during the, uh, the takeoff roll, the first officer was the pilot flying, the captain was the pilot uh, monitoring uh, the situation. And as they were accelerating for rotation for takeoff, the first officer had, uh, had an indication, the auto throttle disconnected, and the, the first officer had an indication that his airspeed indicator was different from what the captain was seeing. So there was an anomalous airspeed indication. So the first officer said to the captain, you have control, and the captain continued the takeoff. At that point, they were going too fast in their judgment to reject the takeoff and stay on the ground. So they conducted the takeoff. Just after taking off, um, at about 400 feet above ground, they got a stick shaker, which in aircraft parlance is kind of an indication of the pilot. It's a vibration in the control column, which suggests that the aircraft is on the verge of stalling. And normally, and then the uh, flight director, which is the instrument that the, the pilot is following, was telling, because the pilot is flying manually at this time, he's not an autopilot. The flight director was telling, uh, was commanding a five degree pitch down attitude. Now the aircraft's at 400 feet, and they're getting instructions to pitch the nose down. Fortunately, because they were in visual conditions, the captain ignored the instrument indications and continued climbing. They climbed out to 3,000 feet, um, advised air traffic control in Toronto that uh, they were going to come back. Uh, didn't say exactly what was going on, didn't declare an emergency at the time, uh, came back, landed uneventfully at Toronto. So that's the no big deal. No accident, no real incident, other than they conducted an overweight landing. And because they were overweight, they had to have the uh, rescue firefighting vehicles on standby. And uh, that's how the incident got reported. So some may consider this no big deal, something that occasionally happens, an instrument malfunction. And uh, in this case, it was due to a failure in the pitot-static system, which is what provides the source of information to the airspeed indicators. It resulted in inaccurate speed indications, a stall warning, and uh, a misleading command to pitch down when in fact that was the wrong thing to do and the pilots didn't follow it. But they handled it well, they landed the aircraft, there was no injuries, no damage, etc. But what if that takeoff had happened in instrument conditions where the pilots couldn't see outside, where they couldn't know that um, which of the two airspeed indicators was correct? or why they were getting this indication. What if they had, in fact, pitched down to five degrees at 400 feet above ground? This could have had a very different outcome. So we found out about this, and we decided to investigate it because we thought it was a great opportunity to see a safety management system in action. And here's what we found. Approximately, um, so we looked at this from the perspective of, you know, was the company aware of this ahead of time, this possibility? What sort of proactive steps did they take? And once this incident happened, what kind of reactive steps did they take? So approximately seven months prior to the occurrence, Boeing issued an advisory to this 737 uh, next generation operators, so this operator and, and others, regarding flight crew and airplane system recognition of and response to erroneous main display airspeed, uh, airspeed situations. The advisory was very dry language, and I'm going to read you word for word the, the it. And what it said was, the rate of occurrence for multi-channel unreliable airspeed events combined with the probability of flight crew inability 
to recognize and or respond appropriately in a timely manner is not sufficient to ensure that loss of continued safe flight and landing is extremely improbable. <laughs> now, I mean, I'm a pilot and I, you know, this is a difficult one to, to understand. Anyway, the company received this and, uh, and other companies as well. And however, the, the operator, so, so despite the manufacturer's warning that erroneous airspeed events were occurring more frequently than predicted, and that the flight crew training didn't require recurring training for this, the operator didn't consider it as a hazard that needed to be analyzed proactively by its safety management system, and so the information was not passed on to flight crews. It was dealt with as a maintenance issue. Okay? So crews weren't advised. So then we said, okay, so had they been advised, what could they have done? Well, they could have ensured that their training, the simulator training that these pilots get, covered off this kind of situation so that if it had happened in bad weather, they could have, um, they, you know, they would have been in a better position to, to handle it. But in this case, fortunately, the good weather was on their side. So then we looked about what about after the occurrence? How did they treat this? And there, too, the operator's safety management system, which they're required to have by regulation, didn't really kick in because the occurrence wasn't recognized at the time as being sufficiently serious in nature to warrant calling in company safety personnel. Nor was it recognized as an occurrence that was reported to, reportable to the TSB. In fact, we found out through a different form, mean, and that's why we decided to go in and, um, and investigate. But because the company didn't recognize it as a reportable occurrence, they didn't uh, seize the co or, or suspend the cockpit voice recordings so we didn't have the, the discussions between the crew at that time. Um, w but fortunately, we had a live crew that we could interview and find out you know, what was going on. But I think this one, and this is the sentence that to me is the, the, the really crux uh, of the issue that I want is it. In short, the effective performance of the crew on this day masked the underlying risks. Now, I don't want to extend from this to what's happening with the Boeing 737 MAX. I do not have information about that. But I'm just saying this is an example of how s information that comes to an operator can be used to proactively assess what steps should we take in case this happens in the form of training, procedures, et cetera. And if it does happen, even though there's no adverse consequence, what can we learn from this so that in other circumstances, it doesn't lead to a different outcome. And this brings me to the question of oversight. So I'll show you uh, some of our findings from, from this report. Is essentially what we said here, when an operator's proactive and reactive SMS don't trigger a risk assessment, there's an increased risk that hazards will not be mitigated. Operators that don't recognize this type of event as reportable may not report it and, uh, or conduct an investigation to further analyze and mitigate the risk. And this is the point I want to make is that Transport Canada, who is depending heavily on air, uh, on air operator safety management systems, especially in the large carriers, um, in terms of, um, you know, kind of a, a supplementary form of uh, a layer of protection, they have to realize that operators may not always identify and mitigate the hazards appropriately, and so they have to tailor uh, their surveillance activities to be commensurate with the capability of the company. Okay. So that uh, completes my, uh, my three um, case studies. And just to, uh, to finish this off, and maybe if we still have time for questions, um, what we tried to do with this is issue kind of a warning, is that safety management systems, while we believe they're a good approach to managing safety, um, it only works if the companies have the ability to proactively identify safety deficiencies, the capability to rectify them, and the commitment to do so. And so you need culture and process together in order to effectively manage the safety. Whole bunch of processes and procedures that sit on manuals on shelves, that's not an SMS if it doesn't have the required company commitment and buy-in to using it, but just wanting to be safe isn't enough either. You do need uh, formal processes. And in addition, you need balanced regulatory oversight uh, from the regulator. So I know that your next topic is going to be security management, and I don't know if you're going to be talking about security management systems. I'm sure there's some, some parallels here. But one of the issues sometimes people will ask, well, what's the difference between safety and security? And sometimes there's definitely an overlap. And I'll give you a very simple example. 
If there's a hole in the fence at an airport that allows pedestrians to get through and to get out onto the runway, and that results in a runway incursion or risk of collision. I had that many, many years ago when I was manager at St. Hubert Tower. The airport authority had a problem with the gate, with one of the gates that led onto the airport, and so it was left open all the time. And we'd get cyclists who'd go out on the runway, uh, you know, on their bikes. So an open, a hole in a gate, an open gate, or a hole in a fence, an open gate, is a security issue because people who shouldn't be there can get on, but they can lead to safety issues. We only do safety, uh, but it could be triggered by a, a, a breakdown in security. Uh, so there is some kind of, uh, it's not a hard and fast line between what's one and what's the other because a security incident can lead to. Another uh, perfect example, the number of railway crossing accidents that occur um, the highest number of fatalities in the railway industry in Canada is, uh, is due to uh, um, trespassing on the railway right of way. Well, that's a security issue because why are they accessing it? But it's also a safety issue because people are getting killed. Now, sometimes, unfortunately, tragically, it's intentional, but sometimes it's just somebody walking their dog with headphones on and they don't hear or see a train coming. So, so on that note, um, I'm, yeah. Well, we did in the, the we did in the railways for sure, where we talked about more fencing uh, around areas of known uh, trespassing. Okay. So, so you, you, you would in fact make yeah comments yeah if if that's what led to the if that's where the safety deficiency is, okay. um, would we would okay. we would. We have a watch list of those issues that pose the greatest risk to Canada's transportation system. With respect to aviation matters, it's the risk of collisions on runways, so runway incursions, and uh, runway overruns when an aircraft goes off the end of a runway, like happened in 2005 in Toronto. And then we have three other uh, multimodal issues relating to safety management and oversight, which I've been talking about. Uh, fatigue management, which is a multimodal issue in the air, rail, marine and also slow progress, uh, that's the regulator responding to our recommendations. Um, and that's also available on our website. And uh, that's it. Um, that's how you can contact us, but if you do have any questions, because uh, I'd be very happy to, uh, to answer them. Question. Or any feedback or, you know. I mean, what I'm hoping came out of this is that the next time there's an accident or an incident, in whatever mode you hear, you won't say, was it pilot error? Mm -hmm. It was the pilot's fault. It was the driver's fault. That you can think about it from a more systemic basis. And depending on what role you play, whether it's in aviation or in some other area, um, when it comes to managing safety risks, and I suspect it's the same for security risks, you have to have a systemic approach that identifies hazards and gaps in the system um, assesses the risk in terms of probability and severity of them happening and then takes mitigating steps and then follows up to make sure those mitigation steps are uh, effective. Because if you go back to that Rasmussen's model, any individual company is in a constant state of flux. Their risk profile is constantly changing from one day to the next, from one month to the next because circumstances change. So uh, an aviation company that's you know, doing a tour, flight tours for, you know, for tourists. It's a beautiful day. Um, there's no wind. Uh, they don't have more passengers than they can carry. They're financially viable. They've got lots of well-rested pilots. Is less at risk than a company uh, that is deciding, well, these tourists that have come from, from overseas really want to go up on a tourist flight, and we're going to take them up even though the weather's lousy and my pilot's tired or he's been working too much or he's not feeling very well. Um, you know, those are, the kind of, those are the kind of pressures that companies are under. And it's how they address those risks uh, that determines at the end of the day uh, their likelihood of having an accident. So thank you very much. One question, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, so SMS has been hugely successful to the point where IKEA has made it into an annex. And you mentioned SEMS, and indeed yes. SEMS is, is an fairly known concept, but it definitely hasn't gone as far as SMS has been. And as a matter of fact, IQ has refused to 
um, even recognize it in its security annex. Mm -hmm. uh, the word is not even mentioned, it's in guidance. Uh, why do you think that is? Canada is a leader on SEMS, and I think it's been a bit of a struggle getting the rest of the world to understand why it makes sense. I honestly don't know why, in the case of, of security, why uh, it wouldn't, um, why ICAO wouldn't embrace it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's, a, if it's, I mean, obviously ICAO has to get all of its member states on board, yeah. uh, and that is sometimes uh, more of a, of a challenge, particularly in, in less developed countries, but that's also where some of the greater risks may be. Uh, at times, so I, I, I don't know why. I know that, that Canada was a lead uh, on safety management systems in Canada, starting in rail, by the way, not air. The air followed rail. Uh, but even in Canada, after more, well, now 15 years, we're still, we still have challenges, and it's still only applicable to the major scheduled carriers, not the small carriers, which are the ones having this, the small, the air taxi operators, the commuters, and those are the ones that are actually having the accidents that would benefit from it. So. I liked um, what you said about regulations can't cover every eventuality, and I've written that down because I think it's a very strong argument for security as well. Mm -hmm. Regulators are you know, just keeping such a tight grip mm -hmm. that I think it's preventing companies from being able to manage their risks. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was really interesting. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Any other? You wanted to ask the question. The um, Annex 13, this accident happened in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia, as a state of occurrence, will lead the investigation, and they've created a, an, a commission of the, the operator and the accident investigation agency and the transport uh, authority. Um, the U.S., as the state of uh, manufacture of the aircraft, uh, state of design and manufacture, uh, also will play a role um, in, in terms of assigning a representative. And of course, they have NTSB investigators over there. I'm not going to comment on the capabilities of the Ethiopians. I don't know what their capabilities are from, from an investigation perspective, and I only know what I know on the, from hearing it on the news. Um, it's, it's very rare to have two accidents in such a short period of time uh, with a brand new airplane. It's not unusual to have glitches, but it's unusual to have two accidents back to back. But whether they're related or not, we don't know for sure, and we won't know until the investigators do their work. So even though I am as curious as anybody else, um, I think we have to wait until the investigators are able to listen to and analyze the recorders and hear what happened, and then they'll be in a better position to see uh, or, or to identify if there's any similarities between the two accidents. Uh, superficially, there appear to be in terms of the aircraft flight path, but, but I don't know. Uh, in this case, Canada and the TSB doesn't have a specific role to play because we aren't the state of occurrence and we aren't the state of manufacture design. However, given the high number of Cana Canadian fatalities, we have appointed an expert observer, which we're entitled to do under ICAO. And we are entitled to be informed of any factual information that comes out. But we don't have the same status as if, say, it had been a Canadian operator or a Canadian aircraft that crashed uh, in that state. So I think that uh, there was a very rapid reaction. And I'm not going to judge that reaction. I mean, there's arguments on both sides. Uh, one say, you know, wait and see what, what before you make that decision, because there's a lot of implications. Wait and see. Uh, but on the other hand, I also understand that the public's worried. And nobody wants to be the one to say, well, we'll just keep flying it until we figure out what happened and then have a third accident. So I think this is one of those cases where, and this was entirely the, the, the decision of the Minister of Transport. We have no input on that, and I'm not going to judge it one way or the other, other than to say that I think, given the world reaction, it's perfectly understandable. But it, I, I think you all should, I hope, suspend judgment of what happened until we know more about what it was about you know, what had happened. And as you saw from this, it's more than just about pilot error, because there's probably more to it than that. But we so won't know that just, until. And maybe just, maybe just more than just the parallels you might see. Like, maybe, like, maybe totally different. Like if we, we may all be surprised and, and find out it's something totally different, or there may be a, be a link. But so in, in terms of when you would expect some type of early indication to come out, well, I think that will I think that will give them, and assuming that the data is intact, uh, 
and usually these things are crash worthy so uh, even sometimes uh, recorders that have been underwater for a long time uh, but I don't know uh, until they actually and, and the last I heard before I came over is that the Ethiopians still hold the recorders and they're trying to decide which European country they're going to send it to to download it because they don't have the capability but I think once they get the data I think I hope that it'll be intact and complete enough to give them a very, a very good indication of what happened. Um, but that being said, the investigation will likely take a long time because they'll have to look at all these other things that I talked about. You know, I mean, weather doesn't appear to be a factor. It was a clear day. But, you know, the ergonomic aspects of it, pilot training, pilot experience, uh, all of those things I'll have to look at. And, uh, and that's why I say, like, the, the, the example I gave you with the, the Sunwing 737, totally different aircraft, totally different situation, but it's still that man-machine, human-machine interface um, that is, I think, increasingly uh, complex as, as our world becomes more complex, as our technology becomes more complex. So. Yeah, well, I, I, I won't go there, but anyway. But thank you. Thank you very much, you very much. Uh, and uh, and I will uh, I will send you a corrected version of that slide, um, so I understand that you will have access to it. So.